so um, let's see. I was asked to, to give a brief and formal research presentation. And I think it's good to keep this informal as informal as possible. So go ahead and interrupt me whenever you want and ask questions as we go along. What I'll tell you about is some work that I started during my postdoc at University of Colorado. And this was done in collaboration with Xi Ji Zhang. And so I'll tell you a little bit about the mantle thermal history during supercontinent assembly and breakup. And in particular, the predicted thermal history beneath Pangaea um, during the period of time leading up to and immediately following the breakup of Pangaea. So this work was motivated in large part by a recent paper by Philip Brandle and others that appeared in Nature Geoscience. And these authors looked at um, glasses, volcanic glasses erupted on the seafloor, and looked at systematic major element variations to infer the mantle potential temperature um, from which these lavas were sourced. And they found that during the um, 175 million years or so since Pangaea breakup began, the upper mantle beneath Pangaea has cooled by about 150 Kelvin based on their modeling. And this is um, a result that's consistent with previous work by um, Kellerman and Halbrook and Halbrook and Kellerman in which um, extensive high mantle temperatures beneath the supercontinent Pangaea have been inferred. Yeah, I'm Ved. I'm familiar with this paper, but yeah. how, given the, the analysis that you're talking about, why would their title say caused by continental insulation? Ah. <laughs> well, their observations are pertinent to the mantle temperature following continental breakup, mm -hmm. supercontinent breakup. Um, but the implication is that while Pangaea was assembled, the mantle temperature increased beneath Pangaea, and following breakup, mantle temperature decreased. They don't do modeling. No, no. They simply present results. So um, there's uh, quite a bit of literature related to the effect of insulating continents on the temperature of the underlying mantle. Going back at least to 1967, this paper by Elder, in which he looked at the effect of insulating continents. This is an um, isocontour of a mantle flow field in two dimensions. And this box that you can see on the surface is um, an insulating continent that he's placed on top of the flow. And he's looking at how the presence of this insulating continent affects the underlying flow field. Pangaea was interesting because it was surrounded by subduction zones. This figure shows subduction zones in the solid line and um, spreading centers with the dashed lines here. Pangaea was centered approximately around present-day Africa. This is from a plate um, motion model by Nan Zhang, one of Xi Ji's former PhD students. And so this, um, this circumpangaea subduction may have actually helped to isolate the flow beneath Pangaea from the flow elsewhere on Earth. Yeah? Is there any reason to go to Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Coming up with these plate reconstructions for the distant geologic past is really difficult because um, we, don't, we don't have preserved seafloor older than you know, 180 million years or so. Um, so all of the plate motions in the Pacific um, hemisphere are essentially extrapolated, by, by which is meant that they remain constant going further back in time. Right, right. Oh, I'm really sorry. Or m me or Ian. <laughs> presumably, many of those plates don't exist anymore. The yeah, ones for which presumably there are that's right. Centers. So it's a big assumption that, um, well, based on based on. Um, preserved geologic terrains, that Pangaea was circled by subduction zones, and that there were, say, no other continents floating around out in the present-day Pacific Hemisphere that are just no longer known to us. right? But these reconstructions are based on Chris Gotiza's work and the Paleomap Atlas. Um, and what Nan did is essentially digitized those 
plate reconstructions and assigned velocities. But the oceanic plate velocities are, are essentially unconstrained for this period in time. But I'll say that there is a big push to extend plate reconstructions in general further back in time. Um, and so Nan is hardly alone in doing this type of work. Okay, so Pangaea may have been surrounded by a subduction zone. I show you here actually the um, surface divergence field. So subduction zones, plates, places where there's convergence at the surface are shown in the blue outlines here, and spreading centers are shown in the uh, red outlines here. Pangaea is here and here on the right-hand side in this projection, and um, the oceanic hemisphere is in the middle. So you can see that there's a subduction zone um, circling Pangaea, and in previous um, numerical experiments by Adrian Lenardic and others, they looked at the effect of a prescribed downwelling, a prescribed subduction zone at the edge of a continent on the evolution of mantle temperature beneath the continent and beneath the ocean. So what I'm showing you here is first um, a what what they're calling a well mixed initial state. So a mantle convection simulation that's been allowed to run forward in time without any interference. And then at some point, what they do is they prescribe this cold downwelling, and they prescribe this downwelling such that it exists across 80% of the mantle depth. And what that downwelling does is essentially acts as a wall, a barrier that's been put in the middle of the convecting system, so that the subcontinental region and the suboceanic region evolve separately in time. Yeah, Brent? Um, do you think something like this would still happen in three dimensions? Well, we're going to get to that, OK? So yeah, Ved? So going back to, to Alan's lecture this morning, I think the first question I already asked is of Max is, if you do something like this, doesn't this violate the governing equations? Because it is not going to occur. Uh, doesn't, doesn't the fact that you're going to set up a pressure gradient, and then you're forcing a kinematic condition that resists that pressure gradient, Aren't you creating some kind of unnatural world that cannot? <laughs> well, as for whether it's an unnatural world that can cannot exist, I uh, I don't have yeah I don't have the answer to that. But I think what Alan said this morning is actually um, relevant here. That the the goal in designing an experiment really is to come up with the simplest experiment that allows you to test a hypothesis. And in this case, the hypothesis that the authors wanted to test was whether the, present, the presence of this um, downwelling at the margin of the continent could isolate the subcontinental region from the suboceanic region. And in a way to, to provide an end member case, one way, one way to enforce that isolation of the two regions is to simply prescribe the downwelling. So I don't see it as an entirely unreasonable thing to do as a thought experiment. I don't think the authors of this study would ever suggest that this is exactly um, how, how Earth works. Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK. So they have an insulating continent here at the surface, and they have a prescribed downwelling. And what they see is that over time, the subcontinental mantle increases in temperature. You can see that it's significantly redder than the suboceanic region, which is whiter, implying that it's colder. So there's a temperature difference between the subcontinental mantle and the suboceanic mantle. And given these um, plate reconstructions, essentially surface velocities going into the distant geologic past, we have the ability actually to do some simulations to see whether this particular flow field that existed around the time that Pangaea was assembled oh, say, between 300 and 200 million years ago, might lead to this type of um, isolation of subcontinental and suboceanic flow, and hence warming, warming of the subpangean mantle. So to this end, we set up some mantle convection simulations. Um, the, uh, let's see, it's excellent that Alan lectured today, because hopefully many of these assumptions are now known to you. But let's see. The initial condition in these experiments is a uniform um, temperature profile calculated using um, free slip boundary conditions. So that is, we don't impose any um, velocities at the surface. We just allow the velocities to go free. 
and we let a calculation run to steady state. Then we take the horizontally averaged temperature profile and smear it out onto the whole sphere. And then we do essentially a spin up with prescribed plate motions for 150 million years to establish an initial condition in these simulations. These simulations also incorporate a chemically dense layer. What I'm showing you here in the lower left is a cutaway of the sphere in which the convections were performed. And this gray blob is the chemically distinct dense layer at the base of the mantle. This is analogous to the LLSVP material that Alan mentioned just a few minutes ago. And this material um, is imbued with compositional buoyancy such that it stays at the bottom of the mantle. So the volume of this stuff is stable over um, 4 billion years, potentially, um, though these simulations are only carried out for about 600 million years. So what I'm showing you here also are temperature anomalies. And the blues represent anomalously low temperatures, and the reds represent anomalously high temperatures. So what you can see are actually upwellings coming off of kind of cusps in this chemically dense material along the core mantle boundary. And you can see downwellings that are actually associated with slabs penetrating into the lower mantle. Um, we include strongly temperature dependent viscosity in these models. We include also a strong lithosphere, a relatively weak upper mantle, um, and an increase in viscosity, a jump in viscosity at the boundary between the upper and lower mantle at, at the 660 or 670. And we also include a linear increase in viscosity with depth across the lower mantle. These models are about 60% internal heated. And before you jump up and say, wow, that's really an incredibly large amount of internal heating, that's because we've already removed the lithospheric heating um, contribution from these models. So the surface heat flow in these uh, calculations is tuned so that the present day heat flux is about 38 terawatts. So that's equivalent to the mantle heat flux at present day. And the internal heating um, contributes about 20 or 21 terawatts to the total heat flow, which is in, um, well, it's in, in the range of proposed values that Bill White told us about yesterday. Um, the, it's not going to significantly change the results here. Um, we're also using an Earth-like Rayleigh number of 2 times 10 to the 8. Um, so we're driving these models using boundary conditions taken from plate reconstructions. For the past 200 million years, the calculations that I'll show you use the plate reconstruction by Maria Satin et others, published in 2012. And prior to 200 million years, we're using the plate reconstruction from Nanjong, which goes back to 450 million years. And as Ian alluded, it does have essentially um, made up plate motions in the Pacific hem Hemisphere. Um, I'll show you just briefly the evolution of the LLSVP material in these calculations. I'm showing you 50 million year increments. This is a global projection. The projection stays constant in time. And if you look down here in the lower right, this is Africa in the middle of the, um, of the, of the map. And the gray area represents LLSVP material. So you can see that at present day, there's LLSVP material beneath Africa and beneath the Pacific. So the long wavelength structure is in, in reasonably good agreement with present day mantle tomography. But there's a significant rearrangement of this LLSVP material over the course of the simulation. In fact, at early times, the LLSVP material is essentially ponded into one pile, which we call a degree one structure. And between about 250 million years ago and 200 million years ago, um, some of this LLSVP material along the eastern margin of Pangaea here is essentially cut off by the circumpangean subduction downwelling and separated from the rest of the LLSVP material, following which it evolves to form a separate LLSVP. Yeah, Ved? Uh, in this exact calculation, I, I don't know. I don't want to misquote you. Um, in, 
It's a little, no, it's less than half. Okay. Yeah. But it's more than is observed at present. The Pacific pile in particular, we overpredict the spatial extent of it. Um, is it by design or what? <laughs> uh, well, it likely comes down to a sensitive dependence on the initial condition. For lack of better information about the initial state of the system, we assume that the LLSVP material is uniformly distributed at the beginning of the calculation. And it could be that if you introduced some perturbation to the distribution of the LLSVP material, that you could come up with something more realistic at present day. And I'll just mention in passing that quantities like the surface heat flux and the core mantle boundary heat flux in calculations like this are essentially predetermined by the prescribed surface velocities. So during times of rapid spreading, there's increased surface heat flow. There's also increased delivery of cold downwelling material to the core mantle boundary and hence increased core mantle boundary heat flow. What I plotted here on the horizontal axis is time and on the vertical axis is um, non-dimensionalized heat flow. Uh, in the top figure, I can tell you that the present day value of around 75 in, uh, in these units comes out to about 38 terawatts. And this maximum value uh, around, well, 90 would correspond to about 45 terawatts. Um, going back in time, if we want to analyze the subcontinental and suboceanic temperatures, we have to identify the subcontinental and suboceanic regions. So in order to do that procedurally, we just need some kind of function that describes continents and oceans. And we do that by just identifying the oldest um, surface present in our model. So we call the oldest 30% of the surface the continents and the youngest 70% uh, the oceans. We did, of course, play with this um, fraction and it doesn't significantly affect our results. But you can see that this continent ocean function, the continents are labeled red in each of these figures, is reasonable going back 200 million years. So armed with this continent ocean function, we can go ahead and we can calculate the changes in subcontinent and suboceanic temperature as a function of time. I'll skip the suboceanic temperatures for now and instead plot subcontinental temperatures. I apologize that this figure is a bit washed out on the screen. The colors are brighter on my laptop. Um, but there's not much we can do about that. So things to note are that the vertical scale goes from a bit below negative 100 Kelvin to a bit above 100 Kelvin. So the overall variability that you see at all depths in the mantle during this period of time going from 450 million years ago to present is less than 200 Kelvin. You can also see that at all depths in the mantle, the right side of this figure looks redder than the left side of this figure. And that reflects a secular cooling trend that I'll show you in more detail in a couple slides. The surface is doing something else because it's, model, it, it's, um, it's um, strongly influenced by the velocity boundary conditions. So again, what's plotted here on the horizontal axis is time and on the vertical axis is depth and the color scale shows you the average mantle temperature beneath the continents. So we can actually subtract the near surface region and the lowermost mantle. In the lowermost mantle, uh, I meant to say that the lowermost mantle temperature is strongly influenced by the presence or absence of LLSVP material. So during periods of time, when there's a lot of LLSVP material beneath the continents, the subcontinental temperature at those depths is much greater because the LLSVP material is compositionally dense, is stable at the core mantle boundary, and is therefore hot. So we neglect these regions in the mantle where temperature is dominated by LLSVPs and where the temperature can be strongly influenced by the prescribed velocity boundary conditions. And we look at the mantle temperatures just in that um, region between actually here 410 and 2,000 kilometers depth. Yeah? What do you mean by by velocity Well, the temp no, the temperature at the surface is essentially prescribed by the surface divergence field. Yeah. Uh, okay, but I mean, if you, like the, the data in the paper, like sampled the uppermost mantle where, where material was molten, right? And 
if your uppermost layer is influenced by the velocity because the the age of the of the crust or the lithosphere is is influenced by this, wouldn't this be the layer you would like to look at to compare to the to the sampled mantle? Well, the inference is that those samples are being produced by decompression melting of material from a greater depth. And in the paper, and in Kellerman and Halbrook's papers also, they argue for widespread increases in subcontinental mantle temperature. Oh, okay, so, so they also argue for deeper temperature yeah. changes, okay. Yes? Well, uh, this is a bit of a problem of the color scale, actually. And I can tell you that just looking at my screen right here, I can see that there's, for instance, a, a large blue region here and a red region here. So I would argue that it's actually not very well correlated with the mid-mantle temperatures. Okay. So maybe we can see it a bit better. If now I plot the average temperature, this is the volumetrically average temperature in that region. And the first thing that you can see is that, um, okay, the horizontal axis again is time going from zero million years ago to 450 million years ago. The vertical axis is the mean temperature that I've calculated. Of course, these calculations were done um, using dimensionless temperature, and I've chosen a temperature scale of 2500 Kelvin to dimensionalize the temperature. But you can see that during this period of time when Pangaea was assembled between about 300 million years ago and 200 million years ago, the subcontinental temperature shown with the red curve did not increase substantially. And in the period of time following the breakup of Pangaea, more recent than 200 million years, the total change in mantle temperature from 200 million years ago to present predicted in all of these models um, is about 30 Kelvin at most. Here you can see that in the 100 million years following the breakup of Pangaea, there's only a, uh, 20 Kelvin of cooling. We can subtract actually that long-term secular cooling trend. And you can see that maybe there is some increase in the subcontinental temperature, but it's very subtle. And following the breakup of Pangaea, again, we see a relatively small decrease in subcontinental temperature. This is probably a result of the fact that these models incorporate a significant amount of internal heating. Um, from the, uh, just, just looking at the temperature increase in the subcontinental region by um, balancing heat production with the density multiplied by the heat capacity of the mantle, and then multiplying by the duration uh, for which Pangaea was assembled, so 100 million years, we can come up with an approximate estimate of the expected change in temperature, assuming no loss of that internal heating of about 30 Kelvin. So it's not, un it's not unexpected that the magnitude of um, temperature increase beneath Pangaea was relatively modest. Yeah? So because 15 is about 60% of 28, should I think about that as meaning like that, or 15 is half of 20, I don't know, right? And your, your rate of jetting heating is about half of what's coming out. So does that mean that there's very little lateral convection of heat, that it's really kind of the mantle that's beneath the continent is heating up radiogenically, and then it's not losing its heat from the top? Well, it means two things. One is that heat is being lost out of the surface. Heat can be lost out of the surface in these calculations in both continental and oceanic regions. Um, and it also means that you can be mixing, thermally mixing, the region beneath the continents with the region beneath the oceans. So unlike the um, calculations that I showed in the motivation, we don't prescribe a perfect separation between the subcontinental and the suboceanic regions. Um, so, so that the isolation of the flows is not perfect. We also did a thought experiment where we prescribed exactly the plate motions from 300 million years ago. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
So there could be multiple things going on. One could be that you have a, an insulating continental lid, um, so it's more difficult to conduct heat through the continents than the oceans. The second thing is that the, um, the flow regime um, beneath the continents and the oceans can be separate, so you inhibit the thermal mixing. In some of these calculations, we've imposed a perfect insulating lid above all the continental regions, and I can show you actually those results here. We also have results in which we've imposed indefinitely the plate motions from 300 million years ago. So the idea is to say, well, maybe the problem is that we didn't wait long enough for the sub-Pangean mantle to heat up. Maybe if we waited long enough, we could actually see really large temperature increases. And in fact, the answer is no. There are a bunch of curves on this plot. Um, but the case where we prescribe the plate motions from 300 million years ago indefinitely is shown with this dotted line. And you can see that temperature does continue to increase beneath the continents going forward in time, but the rate of temperature increase is very slow. So during the period of time where Pangaea was assembled, it's, it's completely reasonable to believe that the rate of temperature increase was slow and that the total temperature increase was quite modest indeed. Uh, the blue is the sub-oceanic temperature. And you can see that actually the red and blue can be quite different, implying that there is some inhibition of thermal mixing between the subcontinental and sub-oceanic mantle. Yeah. When, when you're going forwards in time for the indefinite 300, can you just comment on why it's increasing the temperature? Well, there are a Does few that, things going on. I would First of all, find a steady state. Yeah. Well, it may find a steady state, but we didn't run it truly indefinitely because we didn't have truly indefinite computer time. So we ran it for 500 million years. So this plot has zero million years. This is present day. And you can see that the, pre the 300 million years indefinite case actually extends 200 million years into the future. At that point, we cut off the simulation. So that's part one of your answer. The other part to the answer is that the surface and core mantle boundary heat fluxes may not always be exactly in sync. So the mantle temperature may be changing at any point in time. And it could be that at exactly 300 million years ago, um, the surface and core mantle boundary heat fluxes essentially imposed by the plate motions were such that the mantle was either warming or cooling slightly, and that that trend continues for quite some time. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fair point, that there should be some time scale that characterizes that thermal mixing, and that it should be a few times maybe the time that it takes a slab to transit the entire mantle. And this is showing that that is quite a bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. You think it can be considerably longer? Yeah. It takes a long time. If you have additional heat in your mantle, it takes a long time to cool that back down into the liquid. Hmm. Uh, thanks for your comment. Okay. I'll just say also that our models departed from previous studies of subcontinental and suboceanic. Um, temperature anomalies in the inclusion of a chemically dense layer. All of those other calculations were done using purely thermal convection, whereas these are somewhat more complicated thermochemical simulations. And so the presence and the distribution of this LLSVP material may also have some significant effect on the subcontinental and suboceanic mantle temperatures. Um, so I'll just throw my conclusions up that basically it's very difficult to reconcile um, these geochemical observations, which imply significant sub-Pangean warming and significant 
post um, breakup cooling with uh, predictions from geodynamic models, in particular geodynamic models that incorporate realistic amounts of internal heat production and a realistic Rayleigh number. <laughs> yes? Where we free slip where? Where you said it was maybe I didn't describe that very well. The, uh, what I was saying is that the initial condition is is such that we take a steady state thermal profile from a convection calculation with free slip boundary conditions. And that calculation is designed such that the surface velocities match the RMS velocities present in the initial plate motion stage. So it's just to prescribe some kind of thermal structure that's consistent with the plate motions that we're going to impose at the beginning of the calculations, rather than just starting with something like uniform temperature everywhere in the mantle. OK. What do you mean by regional warming on your final conclusion set? Ah, well. What I showed basically is that creating widespread warming through a broad range of depths over very large areas of the subcontinental mantle is very difficult. But maybe you can explain these very large temperature increases by regional temperature increases. So temperature increases on a smaller scale. For instance, those associated with the arrival of a plume. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that seems like the most parsimonious conclusion. Yeah. But another possibility is that there's a different explanation for the geochemical data. Liz? How do the um, you know, potential temperatures um, really argue that a lot? Um, maybe just in the modern, um, modern mantle and um, how much it varies or what it might be. I guess I'm not sure I exactly understand your question. Uh, the, uh, these differences of, like you said, 200 degrees, right, um, over, the, over time. Mm -hmm. Are within what, what is debated by petrologists for mantle temperature? Yeah. Today. <laughs> so, um, well, I'll say also, when I showed this figure and pointed out that the total temperature variation was about 200 Kelvin, that included the secular cooling trend. And the secular cooling present in these models is about 60 Kelvin per billion years, which is within the range of published estimates, certainly. And it contributes, incidentally, maybe six terawatts of, of heat flow from secular cooling, six or seven. Okay.